Radio Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 25th Hour Radio Show. I'm Kevin Huntsperger from WSIL-TV and KevinHunsBlogger.com alongside my good buddy, Tom Harness of Harness Digital Marketing. Tom, we're back again, baby. Well, it's good to be uh, back today. It has. It seemed like it's been a little while since we've done an interview. About a month or so, yeah. About a month. Uh, and, you know, today we are honored to have Captain Jerry Yellen uh, on the show today. And uh, we, were, we were talking before the show, and I said, I'm so glad you're Army and not Navy, because my whole family is Navy. So um, without further ado, let's give a nice welcome to Captain Jerry Yellen. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be, to be with you. So as we get into this interview, before we start talking about really your military experience, what I'd like for our audience to understand is, you know, as a kid, you're growing up, you end up, you know, you, you go into the military. Tell a little bit about that experience of just getting started and going into the military. Well, I started the model airplanes when I was six or seven years old, 1940, 1930, 1931, 32. And I was very interested in aviation. Uh, built, built also wood models, built fly models, read about the World War One. Uh, pilots, uh, Andy Rickenbacker, and people like that. And I was always fascinated with aviation. And then on December 7th, 1941, at 1230 or so, I heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor. I was 17 years old. And I made up my mind I was going to fly fighter planes against the Japanese. And that's what I wound up doing. I you know, went into the armory. I got the, the papers to fill out. And on my 18th birthday, February 15, 1942, I had my mother and father sign the papers and I became an aviation cadet. Um, never been flying before. And it was a very exciting time in my life. How did you arrive at that decision? I would imagine at that age and at that time, uh, it had to be uh, scary times, obviously, but... What makes you, uh, at, at age 17, decide, I'm going to serve my country and put my life on the line to, to help others? Well, it was an easy decision. Uh, we were attacked by a country. One, you know, there was no reason for the attack, in my opinion. And uh, I was old enough to understand that freedom is where, in in jeopardy. Um, a few days after the attack, Germany declared war on America. Hitler declared war. And we had three nations that were fighting uh, America and the rest of the world. It was a world war. Our allies in that period of time were Russia and China, now seemingly the enemies of the world. And we conquered Germany, we conquered Japan and Italy. And they said they are our friends today. They are our allies in the world today. That's in one in our lifetime. When you made that decision and you started to go through basic training, uh, how hard was it for you to to learn about you know planes and flying? And do you still remember the first time that you flew solo? Absolutely. First off, you had to. I, I was inducted into the service in August of 1942, and I went to Fort Dix in New Jersey uh, to learn how to be a, an army guy. I had to learn how to drill, how to put a uniform on, how to salute. And then we went to Mitchell Field to await assignment, and then to Nashville, Tennessee for classification, and then to Santa Ana for pre flight in California. And then we were sent to Thunderbird Field uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, that uh, the county, Maricopa County, has 68,000 people living in it. Now I think there's 3 million people. And we needed to, we were assigned to an instructor, starting with the alphabet A, five cadets to an instructor. And there were three left over when they got to, to me at the Y. So I was the first one to get the time to solo four hours and seven or eight minutes. 
and I was the first one to solo in my class. And it was just a, a day of, of, of excitement, of, of exhilaration to be in an airplane all by yourself. Stearman. As a matter of fact, the uh, Thunderbird Field in 2017, this year, is going to be 100 years old, and I'll be speaking there on November 10th, the 100th anniversary, because it was inaugurated in World War II, World War One, in, on November 10th, in 1917. So you know, it's been a, it's been a real uh, honor to serve your country. There are three professions, policemen, firemen, and the military put a uniform on. And when they put that uniform on, they pledge their lives, not only to the guys they serve with, but to the general public, who they don't know in the line of duty. And it's an honor to do that. There were 16 million men in World War II put the uniform on, there were 8 million young women who became Rosie the Riveters and built the ships and the tanks and the airplanes that we flew. And we were a nation united. And you have some uh, very unique uh, experiences and opportunities when you were uh, in World War II, uh, being the first land-based fighter mission over Japan in April of 1945. And can you talk a little bit more about that experience? I mean, obviously at the time, what was kind of going through your mind? Again, you're uh, a young man uh, serving your country and, and, and doing things that uh, many today, I don't know, that would have the, the courage or the bravery to do. Well, we, we became fighter pilots after we graduated. We had 10 hours in a P-40 to the field, sent to Hawaii. Joined, I joined the 78th Squadron Fighter Squadron with 28 other guys. And they kept four of us in the 78th Fighter Squadron. That was in that division all my military career. We got P-47s, and we became better fire, fighter pilots with better airplanes. And we were supposed to go into combat using the P-47, and the mission was called off. Uh, it was a mission to take an island that uh, preceded General MacArthur's going into the Philippines. They called it off. We were all disappointed. But then we got B-51s, and that was the best airplane uh, that we had then, and probably as good an airplane uh, as was ever built. And on March 7th, three weeks into my 21st year, we landed on Iwo Jima with P-51. And it was the first time that any of us, well, most of us, had been in combat. Iwo Jima was eight square miles of land, 90,000 soldiers fighting on eight square miles of land so that we could escort B-29s over Japan and that they had a place that they could land. If there was an emergency, there were 22 hundred emergency landings on Iwo Jima B-29, each one carrying 11 full members. So there was apprehension in my life. Would I be able to live up to the status that I had as an element leader or a flight leader? Would I be able to do the job that had to be done? And fortunately, uh, I did that. I flew with 16 guys who were killed. I never thought of them as dead or going. I never thought I was going to die. If I did that and had those thoughts or thought of the guys that were killed as being dead, I never would have been able to fly an airplane again. So I just, uh, uh, I overcome, overcame their death by thinking they were transferred. And I would meet again one day. Of course, that never happened. So there was a lot of apprehension. There was a lot of uh, thinking. Uh, and a lot of things that we did that people don't do today. We have to see our targets. We have to fly behind the airplanes or attack the airplanes in the sky in dogfights. They don't do that anymore. Everything's on the computer. We have to eyeball our, our targets and fire at them and fly the airplane all at the same time. And it was eight hours in a small cockpit. Three and a half hours up, three and a half hours from back, or back, 
maybe an hour over the target. And the missions were long and they were hard. We did that for all of us. So as the, as the war winds down and you go on numerous missions, um, you finally get that, I don't know, if you, did you know or did you realize that the last flight that you were going to have was going to be the last one for World War II? Well, we knew that the war was over when they dropped the atomic bomb on August 6th, and we hoped that we'd never fly another mission. And then on August 9th, 1945, they dropped the second bomb. And then we were called to a briefing on the 13th of August that we were going to fly a strafing mission over Japan on the 14th. And we asked uh, Jim Tapp, our CEO, why are we going up again? And he said, well, the Japanese are not responding. We have to keep them on us. But they're going to broadcast the code word Utah and we'll abort the mission. When that happened, when he said that, my wingman, 19-year-old, Phil Schomburg, from Brooklyn, New York, leaned over and said, Captain, if we go on this mission, I'm not coming back. I said, what are you talking about? We're not going to go on the mission. If they're going to broadcast the code word, we'll abort the mission and come back. On the morning of the 14th, I briefed them, saying, close on my way. Well, we got to the drop tank area where we flew up with external gas tanks, and we had to drop them because we were near the coast of Japan. We had never heard the code word. We went in and we strafed our, the airfields and the targets that we had to uh, been assigned that needed 90 gallons of fuel to get back to Iwo Jima. Someone in the squadron called 90 gallons. I looked at Phil Schaumer on my way, gave him a thumbs up, he gave me a thumbs up, and I led my flight into some weather on the way out to sea to pick up the B-29 that would navigate us back to Iwo Jima. When I came out of the clear skies, Schaumer was coming. And when we landed back on Iwo Jima, we found out that we started to sway. Here, the war had been over for three hours, and we never heard the code for Utah. So that was the last combat mission we well, We didn't know it was going to be the last mission. The Japanese surrender was announced on August 14th, in 1945, while we were fighting. It was three hours before we were fighting. So we knew then that it was the last mission. Now, when you returned home, you were dealing with uh, PTSD, which is something that we talk about a lot today. How, how did you or kind of, kind of walk us through that process of, uh, you know, in 1945, you're, you're still a young man. You've returned home. What Walk us through what you experienced and what you went through then um, here back in the United um, States. Coming home brought me into the real world of, uh, I was raised, thou shalt not kill, I could put a uniform on, and we killed, and I saw and missed 16 guys, and I spoke to them every night. I, I thought about suicide. I didn't have much of a life for myself. I, I met and married a young woman on a blind date. We got married in October 1949. Uh, we had children, four children. But I wasn't a happy camper. I, I couldn't hold a job. I, I gambled for a living on a golf course. And I had trouble sleeping. And just trouble being a human being. Didn't know what was going on. They called it uh, combat stress. Uh, there was no name for it. And a lot of us from World War II did that. Uh, I didn't drink. I didn't do drugs. I didn't beat up my wife. I certainly suffered from some unknown malady, now known as post-traumatic stress disorder. And then in 1975, uh, my wife saw Maharishi Mahesh Yogi on uh, Merv Griffin's TV show. And she said to herself, she's going to learn how to meditate, learn to do TM, Transcendental Meditation. But she learned in July 1975, and I learned in August of 1975 got my life back and removed the stress that I had and it still does today. 20, 22, 24 Iraqi Afghanistan, Afghanistan veterans commit suicide every day and GM helps and uh, it should be taught to more. Those of us who went into service. 
And now today, that is your mission. Your mission is to get out there, spread the word. You do a lot of speaking engagements. Uh, you've written some books, uh, and you have a, a recent book or a fairly new book, The Last Fighter Pilot by Don Brown, which is out on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, he talks about your experiences, and those are meant to help basically get people to come forward and talk and, and try to get used to or get uh, familiar with uh, TM. Yeah, I've got a lot of speaking engagements. I was at the Reagan Library, uh, the Nixon Library last week. Uh, I'll be back at the Nixon Library on November 11th, Barbara State. And I do talk about meditation. People, people listen. It's, uh, it beats the antidepressant, anti-psychotic uh, drugs that the government gives out, the VA gives out to the tune of $8 billion a month for the next 600 months, cost $700 for a veteran to learn TM and their scholarship money available from Operation Warrior Wellness from the David Lynch Foundation and from other sources, and it works. It, it's something that you have for yourself for the rest of your life. It's 42 years since I've learned. I still meditate twice a day, every day, 20 minutes at a time. And I feel it's kept me alive and kept me healthy, kept my mind going and my body going. So I recommend it highly. Do you see moving forward as we become a global, we're already a global economy and we have some unrest times and you mentioned the Iraqi war and having served myself in the army, uh, I was during Desert Storm uh, and I did a rotation after that. And when we have these vets come back, if we don't implement something um, soon, like TM or something that's non-drug related, uh, do you think that this is going to increase or discourage our military or actually hinder our military presence as a whole? Well, I think the leadership of a lot of countries, uh, we in America, uh, I in America, as an American, look back in history to the first caveman who took a rock used it to get something from someone else and used a knife and then a bow and an arrow and then gunfire and then naval and army ships in World War I and airplanes and now we have atomic weapons and now we've de developed nuclear weapons and the smallest nuclear weapon in the American arsenal is a thousand times bigger than the weapons we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We've developed better ways to kill other people. And uh, science has done, done that. But the reality is that the people who are in control of some nations uh, want to use that for power. And that's the height of evil. ISIS, willing to kill other people for what they believe is evil. And using weapons of mass destruction is the height of evil. And we're close to that. And the only way that we should look at life as if all human beings are equal. They're not what they believe. They're not Christians and Jews and Muslims and Buddhists. They're all human beings. And that one man, any man, can fertilize the egg of any woman in the world. We're all exactly the same if we look at eyes and look at each other through nature and not through religion or not from what we believe. Because we can destroy the earth's ability today. And that is a, a good uh, point to bring up too. In 1988, you talk about how your son, your youngest son, married the daughter of a Japanese kamikaze pilot. Did that, talk, talk us through that whole process because obviously, you know, I would imagine you had some feelings uh, one way or another, but you talk about turning your hatred to love. So did that also help with the with your uh, recovery process along with the TM? It was a major, major change for me. In 1983, I was asked to go to Japan, and I didn't feel the Japanese or Japan or people or a place that I wanted to visit. And I told that to my, my wife, and she looked at me and said, Jerry, you never asked me if I wanted to go to Japan. So in 83, I went to Japan, and I was blown away by the treatment and everything that happened to me there. And we gave a trip to Japan to our youngest son, Robert, 
and he graduated at San Diego State in 1984, went to Japan for one for a trip, and took a job teaching English there in 1984. But now it's 43 years later, he hasn't come back yet. <laughs> and the wedding, of, the meeting of Mr. Yamakawa, and what he said about me to his family, uh, for, you know, that, that changed my life. He literally said to his wife that any man who can fly a P-51 against the Japanese and live must be a brave man. And he wanted the wedding to take place so that the blood of that man could flow through the veins of their grandchildren. And they flow through the veins of three of our grandchildren together. And we're all the same. I love my six grandchildren, three from Japan, three from America. It's no different. And that was an eye-opener for me. Tremendous, tremendous eye-opener for me. When you look back at your military experience in serving this great country, and I'm hoping that you, I'm sure you keep up with it today, what are some of the major changes you see with the military that you served in and possibly the military I served in and, you know, and the future veterans that we're going to have? What are some of the major changes you see? Well, the technology has brought us a lot of major changes. I saw General Schwarzkopf when he was briefing the troops in Desert Storm. He looked terrible. And my father and Schwarzkopf and Schwarzkopf's father were boy with chumps in Newark, New Jersey. So I wrote him a letter, and, you know, it was an invasion. We, I don't think we have to do land invasions anymore. I think that the weaponry that we can shoot through rockets that we can drop from airplanes is enough to change the way wars are fought. They'll be much more destructive, hundreds of millions of people possibly killed with nuclear warfare. And that's the difference that we have. We don't see that. Uh, our military is ready to go. It seems likely that the Koreans are ready to go to nuclear warfare and will destroy the Earth's ability to sustain life. That's the difference between today and 1988, 1941, 1917. Uh, with the 1917 wars were fought in, uh, in Europe and hand-to-hand -hand combat, our island hopping was in hand-to-hand combat. A desert storm was more technical. Uh, Iraq and Afghanistan were somewhat hand-to-hand -hand combat. In fact, I think that's the end that today in 2017 we're all about weapons that don't need hand-to-hand -hand combat so the military is today in every nation well i have to echo your daughter-in-law's father's comments about if you're able to fly that many missions in a p-51 uh during world war ii and come out uh basically unscathed for the most part physically that you are, in my opinion, American uh, hero, uh, and I think that uh, a lot of people should should really look at the values that you have from from going into combat from World War II against Japan to what your feelings are today uh, about war and about Japan as a whole. Um, I mean, obviously, you you've grown, and the meditation has been a huge part of that. So I think that a lot of people can learn, and I think your story is one that that does transcend all military, human beings in general, that we have to be able to look at each other as human beings and in the simplest form. I think it's a great message for your program. Uh, I'll continue to deliver it as long as I'm alive. Uh, I think it's necessary to publicize the book, The Last Fighter Pilot, which tells that story. I wrote a book in 1990, 1988, 1990 called of war and weddings, and it's that story as well. It's about the war and about the wedding. And uh, we have to come together. It, it's, it's a solidify human beings as being the givers of life to other human beings, and we pass away all the same. We all come into this world exactly the same. We all go out the same, and we have to protect as nature protects our environment. I, I don't know what else to say. 
Well, it was very well said, and we thank you for your time today, but more importantly, we thank you for your service to our country. Absolutely. And again, it is Captain Jerry Yellen. You can find more at CaptainJerryYellen.com, and we'll have a link as well today. Thank you, sir, and thank you so much for, again, for serving this country and uh, coming out of this and sharing your experience, and most importantly, uh, making a difference in our veterans' lives today. So you're still serving. You know you are. Well, I appreciate all of that. Thank you very much for having me. All right, Tom, a great interview, very poignant, and, and it always seems appropriate time to do a veteran interview. Uh, so many have served our country, and we've had many opportunities here on the 25th Hour Radio Show. You know, it's the message that you really get out of this interview is we were attacked in Pearl Harbor. Captain... Uh, Captain Jerry wanted to serve the country and go fight and defend our country. Kills, destroys, fights Japanese fighter pilots, you know, the entire time of the war. Gets out, has post-traumatic stress uh, or combat stress back then. Son marries a Japanese uh, woman, goes back over, and it it just kind of comes full circle where you can see that there's closure. And I'm sure that that was really some element that helped him close even more what he was probably experiencing any type of stress. Absolutely. I can't imagine, uh, you know, I have a 17 year old right now and I can't imagine he being in that kind of position to serve our country. And I, my hats off to all veterans and, and what they do and continue to do uh, active duty military members. So I never served, but I am uh, very grateful and appreciative of those like yourself who have. Well, on that note, um, let's remember to uh, give a shout out to our wonderful um, DJ or host, Rob Fairless, for allowing us to do these amazing interviews. And he takes care of us and gets us some amazing people to talk with. That's right. Rob Fairless. And uh, be sure, again, to check out CaptainJerryYellen.com. There's also a link to his Facebook page there. And uh, keep up with Tom and I, uh, at Kevin Huntsberger on Twitter, at iTomHarness as well as Instagram and all the other social media needs out there. And be sure to, uh, to uh, keep us up posted on the 25th Hour Radio Show social media pages as well. For Tom Harness, this is Kevin Huntsperger for the 25th Hour Radio Show. Have a great week.